Hi, Will Bostas here. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, hammer control, hammer theory, velocity on shapes, uh, hammer uh, control, how to develop power, how to hold the hammer, how to stand at the anvil, and, uh, and then I'd like to demonstrate uh, why these are important. It, uh, when you're a blacksmith, what you're interested in doing is getting steel hot, or could be copper, or different materials, and applying pressure to it and shaping it so that the pressure causes the metal to flow and the heat allows the metal to flow more readily. You can cold forge. It's not as effective as hot forging. You can cast, but you don't get your grain refinement when you're casting. So blacksmithing has a real powerful utility in shaping and grain refinement. And uh, you'll hear me talk about grain refinement over and over again, and I think the underlying thing is that's what we need to keep in mind. It may look like a shape, smell like a shape, taste like a shape, but it's not internally qual quality until you have grain refinement. So that goes whether you're making an architectural element or uh, a tool, um, whether it's hand forging tool or something you're gonna use under power like a, the power hammer or hydraulic press. So, when you want to shape, you need to take into consideration the force that you're putting into the steel. So we talked about the forge last time, and I'm going to introduce you all to a, a new style of forge uh, in this next series, a uh, ribbon burner forge that uh, I built a year ago. And I had a couple more students build it along with me and followed the plans of the ribbon burner and the, uh, the uh, uh, an anvil's ring. And uh, it's a powerful forge. It's a very professional tool. And uh, it's a little abrupt if you're not used to that much power, so I'm gonna go over the nuances of it. But when you decide that you wanna forge something, it's because no other process is the most convenient way of doing it or the most fastidious way of doing it. If, if you can weld it, weld it together. If you can machine it, machine it together. Uh, fabricating, um, does, you don't have to uh, consider all of the uh, dangers and the specific tools of blacksmithing so you can fabricate things you can cast things but when you can't do those three things fabricate cast or machine then um, maybe the best solution will be forging so when we're forging we're getting the the metal hot and it's going to flow and uh, it's going to flow that's it's going to react to the pressure that is imposed on it and what we're going to be working with is the anvil. The anvil is going to be supporting our steel and then the hammer is going to be applying the pressure on top. And typically you get about 60% of your force from the hammer and you get about 40% of the force from the resistance to the hammer. So for that reason, you need to rotate your stock. Uh, I call it tumbling. A lot of the blacksmiths call it tumbling. Some of the technology or terminology I'll be using is very specific to uh, me and in others, but it's, it's uh, common terms. So one way of like, thinking about forging is by using clay. And uh, I, I like Plastilina, it, not particularly this brand, but Roma Plastilina, it's a medium, and it doesn't really matter what color, uh, but uh, the, the soft is too smeary, the hard is too brittle. So if you forge either one of those, then you'll find that it's not gonna be as uh, useful of a tool. But you can see, for instance, one of my students years ago uh, pinched out a dragon head. We were forging dragon heads. And uh, I kept this one, of course, it's like, uh, got some shelf wear. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reforge this, but this is the kind of thing that you can do with the Plastilina, is you can work out volume. You can work out tooling. You can work out steps. So it's very easy to take this from uh, just a block and then forge it to the rectangular shape, forge your shoulders, you start using your butchers and your punches and your fullers and your chisels and then you can come up with something that's interesting. So this uh, piece of plastilina is at least 10 years old, I would say, and uh, it does it never hardens. And it's, uh, it's, sulf it's got sulfur in it, it's clay, and uh, it's got oil in it. And for that reason, it continues to flow. So I'm gonna use the plastilina to demonstrate what I'm talking about as far as what a hammer blow does. And I also wanna demonstrate at the anvil, how I stand at the anvil and, and so forth. I've got an assemblage of hammers here and some of them I've made and some of them I've collected over the years. And uh, as well as I've got power hammer tools that will mimic a hammer. 
So whether you're using a small hammer or a large hammer, they should have uh, predictable shapes. And so the, the forging hammer that I use mainly is a cross peen hammer. And that means that the peen is crossways with the handle. I select a piece of uh, hardwood. Typically it's Osage orange uh, or hickory will work. Um, and uh, about 14 inches long. So by the time I finish grinding it, 13 and a half or so, 13 and a half to 14, I, uh, the handle itself is oval. It's got flat flats here all the way up. So it begins at one by two. And I start uh, carving it out with the belt grinder. So I have this little knob at the bottom and the knob at the bottom keeps the hammer from slipping all the way through my hands. It tells me when I'm at the end of the handle and the uh, hips at the top are a nice place for resting um, the fingers. So we have on the handle itself, it's got a decorative aspect and I like the decorative uh, carving of that because it kind of mimics some of the fuller marks and, and some of the fullering that we're doing in the hammer head. It also splays here at the top of the hips and that accepts the hammer head. And so the hammer head is pressed on to the point in time where it no longer goes any further. Now I use Z6000 glue to uh, make sure that that hammer doesn't fall off the handle. But once this handle is shaped to the eye of the hammer head, it's not going anywhere. But uh, that hips keep the hammer head from going further down. At the top, I use a wood wedge lengthwise to the hammer and I use two steel wedges perpendicular to that. So what it does is it, it breaks the wood out this way and it keeps the hammer from flying off the handle from the end of the handle. So what we've got is hips and then that uh, uh, mushroom shape that you get from driving the wedges in. So that holds it in place, the E6000. And the fact that that handle is fit very well, you could dry fit this handle and you could get a lot of work out of it and you, it would loosen up a little bit. But with all of these features, that hammer does not come off of the handle. Now that's a very large eye. And I think that's important because that gives you a lot of contact with the hammer head. So it also prevents that handle from breaking in case you have an errant hammer blow. Some people will pick up my hammer and use it. And I can tell that people have used it because they've gouged it by driving drifts and missing and putting hot steel on it. I would never do that to my hammer. But uh, yet, nevertheless, that kind of abuse, the hammer handle will hold up a almost a lifetime. I think that uh, this uh, I handled three years ago, but I've got hammers that I handled 20 years ago and they're still uh, going strong. Um, so this hammer has a slightly rectangular face. So it's a little bit wider than it is width, uh, a little bit longer than it is wide. And uh, I, I prefer that. And I also prefer a square, a squarish face. So in other words, it's slightly rectangular, but it's for the most part square versus a round face. So in, that, in other words, this is a round faced hammer. And uh, if you need a round faced hammer, and I'm gonna talk about that here in a minute, then you should select a round faced hammer. This is not the only hammer that you should own. You should own multiple hammers because not one hammer will do it, but one hammer will do a lot um, versus um, if you don't know what a hammer does and just, it it's a beater and then you just kind of, you know, beat things until they look right. So uh, these hammers have similar proportion. They're two and a half pound in weight, but there's there's some nuances to the hammer handle, nuances to the hammer head that I'd like to discuss. Um, so when you, when you choose a hammer, first of all, you're gonna choose a hammer based on uh, two and a half pounds is your common blacksmithing hammer. You can go heavier, I would, I would suggest uh, warming up with a lighter hammer. Um, you can always default to a two and a half pound hammer. That's your uh, standard in blacksmithing. And whenever I make a hammer, I'll, I'll put the weight of it on top. And so it's in my hammer rack. I can tell that that's two pounds, eight ounces. And uh, you can still see it's, it's somewhat legible. Two pounds, eight ounces. I also like to put other information on a hammer. Uh, this one was forged during the eclipse. So uh, we made a eclipse stamp and that was stamped to commemorate that that's the maker's mark and uh see if this has any other i i hammer I also put the weight on the bottom just in case i couldn't read it from the top um other other pieces of information this was 2004 that's when i made that hammer 
2004. It's a distinct, I can, I can tell the mark. This one is uh, made out of 1045. And so I made a mark that, uh, that said that this steel is 1045. And so I know what steel it is in case uh, I want to reproduce that or heat treat it. This hammer was forged in 98. So it's fun to, um, to customize and also give information on these hammers. But when you pick up a hammer, like I said, you're gonna choose it based on the weight and you're gonna choose it based on the shape and um, the grind. So this one is, uh, like I said, it's cross peen and it's got a nice peen grind so that it's got a slight crown here and then that peen falls off here at 45. And so when I, when, I, when I forge these hammers, I allow that peen to spread and then I grind this at a 45 like I showed you on grinding the anvil. And then I grind the edge of that and the edge of that and the edge of that and the edge of that. Also grind the edge of this, the edge of that, the edge of that, the edge of this, that, and that. So it creates a hemisphere um, by breaking the corner on the diamond into the 45 and then 67 and a half and uh, what's the 22 and a half. So 22 and a half, 45, 67 and a half, and the edges of that, the edges of this, it creates a ball here. So that's the, that's the idea behind this hammer. It's got a predictable crown here that falls off. Then I, I turn these into balls. So I know that if I hammer with that, I'll have a radial spread of the material. If I hammer with this, I'll have a peen spread of material that's perpendicular to the longitudinal shape. So this is your that longitudinal shape and the metal is gonna be spreading this way and this way. Now on the face of the hammer, the face is slightly crowned like the peen is. And I break the corners of the face into uh, 45, 22 and a half, 45, 67 and a half, and then I radius those. And so these become fullers also. So there's a fuller and it's accessible when you tilt the hammer. So I know that on the face, I've got a, a, a crown that's just barely broken. It's high in the middle. And then when I tilt it, I've got a fuller. And so I can use the inside fuller, the outside fuller, the top fuller and the bottom fuller. Uh, the corners of these are not only broken this way and this way, but also broken this way and then broken here and broken here. So these have a slightly radial spread. It's not quite, it's a quarter of a sphere. Um, and so uh, I, if I need to, I'll, I'll, I'll hammer with the corner of the hammer and I'll get a radial spread off of the corner of that hammer. So when I select a hammer, it's gonna be, uh, it needs to be ground properly. It needs to have predictable shapes. And if I wanna spread generally, I, I use a cross paint hammer. When I wanna spread radially, I'll use a ball paint. And I use different uh, sizes of ball paints. I have three different sizes here, depending on what it is and how much crown I need when I'm forging with the ball. This, this ball paint I, I made so that it, it gets deep into a shape. So when you when you're, uh, understand the selection of the material, grain refinement, proper forging temperature and procedure, which I'm gonna go over, then it, it, uh, it opens up a lot of possibilities on the tooling and then the tooling opens up possibilities on the shaping. And that's when you become uh, fluent with the process and you get your voice with the process and then you wanna creating your own style. So it's, it's important to do, understand this concept of the selection of the hammer and then ultimately when you make your own hammers, um, these nuances of the shape. Now that doesn't mean that you can't create these nuances with a store-bought hammer. So this is uh, one of my favorite looking hammers. It's a Swedish style cross beam. And with the, when you buy these hammers, they're pretty much perfectly flat. And so what you want to do is you want to grind the hammer like I did the anvil, like I just talked about with that forging hammer. Now, let me show you a test that you should do with your hammer. And if it doesn't pass that test, you should grind your hammer. So at the anvil, and you don't have to have a Tom Clark coffee anvil. You can do this with a railroad rail. You can do this with a forklift fork a big piece of steel. Um, my first anvil, it was just layered steel that uh, I cut into an anvil shaped object. And I was real proud of that. It weighed about hundred pounds. And I'll drag that up for you guys uh, in a future video. 
And the hammers that I made were built the same way. And so I didn't know anything about forging hammers. And so again, my hammer was stacked. This is three eighths by inch and a half stack plate that I cut out with a torch. And my torch cutting skills were pretty poor back then, but it didn't matter. This hammer is uh, 85, 35, 30, 35 years old. And, um, and I didn't really know anything about the nuances of the peen. I didn't know anything about the nuances of the face. Although I can see that I'm starting to, even then when I didn't know anything about it, I, was, I made a rectangular face that was uh, mainly vertical. It's an inch and a half wide, which is the size of my hammers now. <clears throat> and in fact, when I compare the hammers, where's my, where'd my hammer go? Mm, oh, when I compare my hammers from 35 years ago to now, you can see that the proportion is identical. And uh, it was just beginner's luck is what it was. Um, I think that, you know, do something, even if it's wrong or if it doesn't work. And so it, that, back then that's, but what my philosophy was, I didn't have anybody to, to tell me uh, what to do. And so I welded it up here. I MIG welded that, MIG welded that. And it doesn't have much rebound, but you know, it's like, a, it's kind of like I could, I could forge with this. And I forged with that for about three, four years until I got my very first channel lock blacksmithing hammer. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But I want to talk about what the hammer... Um, we were gonna use this one, but I'll use this one too because I know this one is not gonna work. When I was artist in residence at the National Ornamental Metal Museum in 1997, um, Bill Fiorini, uh, he demonstrated making hammers. And uh, one of the things that he showed us at the end of the workshop was how to tune a hammer. And uh, I don't know if that makes much sense, although when you tune your hammer, it'll make all the difference in the world. So what he suggested was, is on your anvil, is to hold the handle parallel with the surface and then pinch it at the back of the hammer as if a fulcrum. And then this is your pendulum and then let the pendulum drop. So when that pendulum drops, then that shows you that that hit twice and then it fell off the anvil. That means that that's high. So if that's high, that's what's hitting first, and that's what's causing it to fall off the anvil. Let's see what happens with the peen. That's not bad, four or five taps before it fell off the anvil. That's what it should do, okay? So if you're finding that you're, when you pinch that hammer and you let it go and it's consistent, that that means that whatever direction it's bouncing, the opposite is, is high. So with that high, what I will do is, I'll either use an angle grinder, a sander, a sanding belt, or if you have a belt grinder, use a belt grinder. So I'm gonna show you how to tune this hammer. In the flat belt area, I'm pressing it down because in the slack belt area, it's giving it a, a crown face. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, press it down. I won't be working here at the hard contact wheel. If I work it here, then the belt has to follow the contour of the face. And what happened was, is that I pressed it down and it only sanded here. And that's because that's the high point. Let me do that again. You can see mainly it's knocking this down. Then I'll go 90 degrees to that. That knocked that down. I go 90 degrees for that. Knock that down somewhat. And then I'll, whatever I can do to get 90 here. Okay, what's happening is grinding most here, a little bit here, and then nothing here in the middle. So now I've got all four quadrants ground. Now I'm gonna go on the diamond. That diamond, that diamond. Now notice these new scratches eliminate the old scratches. That means that I'm ready to move on to the next diamond. And so, here it is. Now, if I, I've ground all four diagonals and all four quadrants, this hammer should 
now balance on the anvil. So that same test from last time. Okay, so that's a lot better. And the reason why I'm going over that is because I wanna talk about how to hold the hammer. And it'll make a lot of sense if your hammer is tuned to be able to hold on to the hammer. So my hammer is tuned. It's not a magic hammer, it's a predictable hammer. Okay, so, so when I work at the anvil, I work lengthwise. That way I have access to the edges of the anvil, complete access to the horn, access to the hardy, access to the heel. And the anvil should be about knuckle height. So when you're standing up straight, about knuckle height. So this may be a little bit high, but I like it like that because if you find yourself squatting when you're forging, that means that you're subconsciously compensating for the anvil that's not, that's not high enough. Conversely, if, if it's too high, you're not gonna get a good, powerful hammer blow because you're not gonna be able to get the follow through. So this is about right, and uh, I, like, I like it right at knuckle height, okay? So the handle, like I said, is 13 and a half inches long. It's a racetrack oval. It's got these this hips and this little knot down here. And I'll work different parts of the hammer, but the main part of the hammer that I use is this hammer, this handle right in here. You can see where it's mostly polished out. That's where I'm holding onto my hammer. Now I don't, when I make the handles, I don't polish the handles. I don't take them to a 240 or a 320 or a 400. You can still see the marks of the grinding uh, belt in it because that gives me texture from, uh, that allows me to have texture to hold on to it. Otherwise the handle would be slipping in my hand a lot. So when I pick up the hammer, I pick up with my thumb on the side and I rotate my hand. Now that's very different. This is a very Hoffy technique. Anna Ray Hoffy understands physiology, understands physics. He understands uh, uh, fluid flow. He's got a tremendous mind. And he studied Alfred, ha Alfred Haberman and he, and he looked at the way that he stood at the anvil, looked at the way he developed power. And Haberman holds on to it like you're holding on to a baton, uh, like you're directing an orchestra. And so, so when you hold on to it like this, then it allows you to have a loose grip. Now, it mainly, let me, let me back, back up a little bit. The main thing it allows you to have is the access to this part of your wrist. So we, can, we have flexibility in this part of our wrist. I have 180 degrees in that part of my wrist. But this, I've got about 30 degrees. And when you hold on your hammer like this, then you're using that 30 degrees flexibility. But if you rotate your hammer hand and you put your thumb on the side with your index knuckle on the top, then you rotate that and you access that 180 degrees. So when I'm working, I'm gonna be work, I'm gonna be whipping the hammer into the steel. I'll be using my wrist. And also when I loosely hold on to the hammer just a little bit, I'll, I'll be able to get a little bit more velocity out of that hammer blow. So you might want a light hammer blow. A light hammer blow is gonna be something, and I'll get the, this is a little bit, this is like a medium hammer blow. Of course, we forge everything square. And overlapping hammer blows. So I'm gonna forge this, and I'm gonna, just like a bladesmith, I'm gonna forge that into Damascus. In fact, if I use different colors of clay, you can create a Damascus pattern just by doing this. And the plastilina, comes in different colors. So if you wanted to explore uh, pattern development in pattern welded steel, this would be one way of doing it. So that very quickly went from a dragon to a bar of steel and using overlapping hammer blows and keeping the stock square. So if you know, if I'm not, I'm working it like this, then, then I've got, it's rectangular, that's narrower than that. And I learned this from a book in a Russian book called uh, The Forging Practice and it's, it's called keeping it contained. You have a ratio of containment and it's one to two. And if you go any much further than that, so if I go to 
one to three, so that's five eighths, that's about two and a quarter, then if I hit it, what I'm gonna get is an I-beam effect. So in order to keep from getting the I-beam effect, you're gonna tumble it in your rectangle. Once you exceed the square, then you tumble it 90 degrees, and that'll keep you from getting a, either a, a, a fold or that um, I-beam effect. Now, it doesn't mean that that fold isn't aesthetically something you want. The I-beam effect is something you might want, but if, you, if you're trying to avoid that, avoid that, then keep your steel contained, which means that don't go much past one to two. One to three is acceptable. One to four can only be done successfully, consistently under the power hammer. So what I'm doing is I'm overlapping my hammer blows. Now I've got a little bit of a rhombus. We'll talk more about that too. So now, when I have a light hammer blow, I'll use my wrist, just my wrist. When I have a medium hammer blow, I'll use my wrist and my elbow. When I have a heavy hammer blow, I'm gonna use my shoulder and my elbow and my wrist. And then as I'm doing further refinement, I'll be using my wrist and my elbow and then to the point in time where I just use it my wrist. Break the corners, planish. Tumble to make sure that it's square. You can tumble between hammer blows if you're fast enough. Overlapping hammer blows. And the nice thing about tumbling between hammer blows is that you can, you can get a preview of what needs to be done on the bar. And it's just a mental exercise, but it's also just an efficient way of creating that shape. Now you can see that even the dirt created my pattern. If I were creating pattern welded steel, I would be able to, I would be able to see what would happen if I manipulated that. You know, say for instance, I put a twist in it and then I forged the twist out of it. So before you go into your expensive steel combination, you can see what the effect of um, different colors or different dirtiness of clay. And so now you can see what a twist would do if that were pattern welded steel. I could twist it tighter. Okay, so, so I talked about how to stand at the anvil, how high the anvil needs to be, how to hold the hammer. Now I can, I can work down here, I can work up here. If I work down here, then I get more leverage and you've got a weight at the end of a fulcrum. And if it's here, then you'll develop a certain amount of power. If I hold it way out here, then I'm gonna develop more power because it's further out and it's accelerating faster. Work is equal to mass times acceleration squared. So you can get more work. And let me explain this here on this handout. So work is equal to mass times acceleration squared. So if I wanted to double my work, I could double my mass. If I wanted to double my work, I could, I could double my acceleration. If I double my mass, I get twice as much work. If I double my acceleration, I get four times as much work. So what's, what, what's most important, what's very important is the mass of a hammer. In other words, two and a half pounds, three and a half pounds. But equally important is the acceleration is if you can accelerate it faster, then you can get a square of that increase. So this, we talked about the hammer, and now you can put your thumb on top of the hammer. And that's okay, except that it kills your bounce. So when I work, it kills my bounce. And really, where does, where does the energy go? It goes into my arm. You can see my arm shake. And that's okay if it works for you, it's not wrong. It just, it's another, way of holding onto the hammer and some blacksmiths want you to work that way. I just want you to think about every which way and try and see what's best for you. You can also hold onto the hammer so that the cleft is on the top of the handle. And the problem with that is, and that's how I used to forge. I forged like that for 10 years and I wound up with uh, wrist problems. Uh, 
And the going thing around the Blacksmith Conference back in 1998 was what brand wrist brace do you recommend? And in uh, 1998 is when I forged Larry Hoffy and he showed me the way of loosening up my grip and my wrist problems went away because I wasn't using that part of my wrist. So the cleft on top grasps firmly, not recommended. It can set up tendonitis and bursitis and carpal tunnel. And if you're having problems with your wrists, it's because of the shock of the hammer blow. So instead, I'm gonna suggest thumb on the side of hammer, index knuckle nearly on top. It's a loose grip. I recommend that choke midway. Uh, now, how do I develop power by doing that? Remember, we've got the light hammer blow, which is just the wrist. We've got the medium hammer blow, which is the wrist and the elbow. We've got the hard hammer blow, which is the shoulder, the elbow, and the wrist. And then there's one more hammer blow, and I discussed it just like very briefly, but it's to get this hammer to accelerate, notice what's going on in my hand. And so if I hold on to it with my thumb on the side, and by the way, the thumb on the side tells me where the edge of the hammer is. That's why this has flats on both sides. Then I can loosely hold on to it. And so when I come down with the shoulder, the elbow and the wrist, then the hammer can also whip in my hands because I'm not holding on to it with a death grip. So these four stages will give you the power that you need without having to go to a five pound hand hammer. I've worked with five pound hand hammers, it's great. Not too long before you're gonna be like uh, wondering, maybe I should warm up with a lighter hammer. Uh, maybe a lighter hammer will work if I accelerate it. Maybe I should change my grip. So those are the four stages. Now, the hammer works best if it's proportioned so this hammer is not quite proportioned properly. Uh, it's got a lot of weight on the face and not too much weight on the peen. So the handle is very off center. And what, what, can, what can happen if you have your handle that's just too far off center is that the hammer, when it comes down, it's gonna perpendicular to the surface that you're hitting is where the hammer is gonna rebound from. So if you have a lot of cheek around the hammer handle, which I get from opening up that eye so large, then there's a lot of centralized mass here. And so uh, these hammers have been sold as balanced hammers. You wanna, well, what's a balanced hammer? Well, first of all, it's the way it's ground. Secondly, is the way where the mass is centralized. So if the mass is centralized here, then when I draw a perpendicular off of this, I'm still going through the hammer mass itself. It's not until I get to here that I'm off of the hammer mass. And so knowing that, that allows me to get a faced hammer blow, but also a tilted hammer blow. And a tilted hammer blow to the point in time where that falls off of that perpendicular, it will still bounce too far and it's gonna fall over, of course. There's pros and cons to having a hammer that is a little bit more compact and has a lot of width here. If you have a really long hammer, then what you can do is metalsmiths, for instance, when they're planishing vessels in copper or silver, they want to repeat a hammer blow. And so if you took a wheel and you spin it like a bicycle wheel, try to move it out of that rotation, the, the inertia of that rotation, it's difficult. And then so if I took a hammer and I copied a segment of that wheel and I put a handle down on it, you're going to get that same inertia that's going to prevent that hammer from walking from one side to the other. So the longer the hammer, the easier it is to replicate a, a hammer blow. That's why planishing hammers are long and that's why they're curved so that you have that segment of a wheel that, uh, that gives you that inertia. Forging hammers, you may want to forge a couple hammer blows on the flat, a couple hammer blows tilting the hammer. You may want to flip it around and, and spread this material out. You may want to pull radial shapes out of out of the corner here. Maybe it's going to be a, a fishtail finial. So it's nice to have that compact mass that's balanced so that even in between hammer blows, I can move that, that material. And the hammer is going to give me a favorable result. Now you can see that 
by using the peen, it spread the metal to the same thickness that wide. By using the edge of the hammer, it's, it's, it, it wind it a little bit, but it mainly moved it in this direction. So if you don't understand the tilting of the hammer or using the peen, then what happens is, is that if I wanna get a shape that's similar to this, then I'm gonna hit it like this, and then I'm gonna hit it like this. Remember the ratio of containment, one to two, uh, don't exceed one to three, but one to two is a good time to tumble so that you don't get an I-beam effect. So what I have to do is I constantly have to correct my spread. But if I understand the tilting of the hammer, then it's a lot more efficient to get that material to spread out. So, so the hammer should be balanced. It should, it should be compact. It should be ground so that it bounces. It should bounce on the peen also. And when it bounces on the peen or on the face, I can hold on to the hammer literally with two fingers. We're not talking about a great deal of crown. We're just talking about enough crown so that that is in the middle. And I demonstrated how to do that by grinding the quadrants and then grinding the diagonals. And that way that everything falls off from the center and everything falls off from the center. And you got a hammer that you can hold on to with two fingers. You can literally forge with two fingers with this hammer. Okay. Now, let's see what other hammer faces do. This, uh, many smiths like using a ball peen. And a ball peen will work if you, that's the shapes that you intend. If you don't, then you may wanna have a square or a slightly rectangular faced hammer and then have a ball peen for the kind of work that you're gonna wanna do. So if I, if, uh, if I'm mainly working, so I work with a handle lengthwise and I work with the stock perpendicular. And then when I work with a square face, I know that by the time I get down to here, the metal is gonna spread this way, this way, that way, and that way. It's gonna be a little weak in the corners. So it's crowned and then it drops off. It's crowned, it drops off, crowned, a little bit of an angle, and then this would be crowned. If I want it to be round when I'm forging, and that's when you choose a round faced hammer. Now this has a slight, slight crown round and this is quite profound round. And so you should give yourself some clue on um, what side you have. And so farriers will grind a flat surface right here so that when they put their thumb hill, they'll know that that's the flat side because they have a very similar hammer. It's called a rounding hammer. And then this side is gonna be radius so they'll know when they put their thumb there that that's the radius side so you don't even have to look at it you'll know which side has the pillow and which side has the flat so if i forge the same shape and i'll probably have to forge that again just to kind of like give you an idea i'll do that one more time in the middle of the bar just to talk about how how it's radius and then tapered radius tapered tapered because the corners don't do as much work as the flat. Now, if I wanted that to be round, then you go with a round-faced hammer. About the same crown, same crown. So the same amount down, and you can see that it finished the circle where it's not flat here, it's, it's crowned there. So depending on how you want the metal to flow is, is going to be the shape of the hammer that you're selecting. So if I'm uh, creating the, the uh, lobe of a leaf, then I'm gonna wanna go with a round-faced hammer. If I'm drawing out a spear tip, then I'm gonna wanna go with a, a flat-faced hammer. So uh, the hammers, though, will, still, will have very similar proportion. They have the same handles. So when I go from one tool to the next, it's not a great deal of um, difference. And, I, and I'm familiar with this driving process, it's just that this part of the tool is doing something um, that I need for, you know, based on how I need that metal to spread.